This is the big time, and it takes place in a place called The Place, which is a um, stage outside of time and space, a kind of theater and around uh, with the void as the audience. And it's a place um, where soldiers come that are involved in various battles throughout time and space come for rest and recuperation. And uh, the place has various ladies of the night who also um, double as nurses. And their job is to get the uh, soldiers happy and back again into fighting shape so they can go out for further uh, battles. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, our characters include Sid, who is sort of in charge, Doc, a Russian drunk, Bo, a riverboat gambler from an altern alternate American South, three women, Maud, Lily, and Greta. And um, as I said, they send soldiers patched up and happy back into battle. And there are two sides in the change war, the spiders and the snakes. And both sides enlist the recently dead who they pluck um, from their normal time streams just moments before they die and bring them into this, the place and the change war or the big time. And uh, these soldiers go through time and places and space uh, to various different battles uh, to ensure that sometime in the far, 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 far future, uh, ultimate victory is achieved. And uh, soon they're joined by three soldiers, a Nazi stormtrooper, an English poet, and a Roman. And then three more, an alien from the distant past, an alien from the future, and a woman soldier. And uh, the poet and the new girl fall in love. An atomic bomb was set off and will explode soon if they don't find it and defuse it. And there's a maintainer that keeps the place functioning uh, that has mysteriously vanished. Um, and uh, the soldiers in the place, like in all wars, are fighting battles that they can't really understand the reason for and will not ever actually see the results of. Uh, the past and the future are fluid, which allows battles to be fought and refought, and uh, hence change the uh, course of history. And no one in the place believes that they are fighting on the side of right, but rather just for the side that originally plucked them from their normal time. And they don't even know who or what the spiders or snakes are, nor what they want. And there were many discussions and uh, about all that, uh, what they're doing there and so on. And uh, there was even a discussion a little bit of, of wondering whether it, instead of going through time and space in all these battles, if they could go through time and space and their soldiering forays for the purpose of creating peace. Um, and uh, there was also discussions about the maintainer and inversion. The maintainer is what keeps the place uh, functioning, but as I say, it's been uh, disappeared. And as a result, the place got locked down. And as far as they know, they may be the only ones left in the universe at all. And um, so there's a lot of discussions, a lot of questions, a lot of accusations, uh, uh, checking of alliances, uh, questions of who planted the, the, the uh, atomic bomb that's apparently there and apparently gonna go off or who hid the maintainer. And there's literally physical fighting over the maintainer, which they find and they get turned on and the proper gravity and conditions are restored to the place. And then uh, apparently an emperor spider appeared, or was it just a ruse? And uh, there was a threat 
to let the atomic bomb explode and more fighting, struggling for the bomb, working to find out how to defuse it and so on and so forth. And that's the basic backdrop here. And um, with that in mind, it's time to sit back and relax and join us now in the place to find out what happens in our final episode and adventure in the big time. And once again, uh, please uh, mute your sound. And uh, we very warmly thank you and very much appreciate your presence here. Please enjoy. Chapter 16, familiar with infinite universe sheaths and open-ended postulate systems, the notion that everything is possible. And I mean everything and everything has happened, everything. So said Heinlein, the possibility binders. An hour later, I was nursing a weak highball and a black eye in the sleepy time darkness on the couch farthest from the piano, half watching the highlighted party going on around it and the bar, while the place waited for rendezvous with Egypt and the Battle of Alexandria. Sid had swept all our outstanding problems into one big bundle, and since his hand held the joker of a minor maintainer, he had settled them all as high-handedly as if they'd been those of a bunch of school kids. It amounted to this. We'd been introverted when most of the damning things had happened. Hmm. Sorry? So they can't hear me, right? Um, we'd been introverted when most of the damning things had happened, so presumably only we knew about them, and we were all in so deep, one way or another, that we'd all have to keep quiet to protect our delicate complexions. Well, Eric's triggering the bomb did balance rather neatly Bruce's incitement to mutiny, and there was Doc's drinking while everybody who had declared for the peace message had something to hide. Mark and Cabby, I felt inclined to trust anywhere, Maud for sure, and Eric, in this particular matter, damn him. Illy, I didn't feel at all easy about, but I told myself there was always has to be a fly in the ointment, a darn big one this time, and furry. Sid didn't mention his own dirty linen, but he knew we knew he'd flopped badly as boss of the place and only recouped himself at the last minute flimflam. Remembering Sid Trick made me think for a moment about the real spiders. Just before I snuck out of surgery, I'd had a vivid picture of what they must look like, but now I couldn't get it again. It depressed me not being able to remember. Oh, I probably just imagined I'd had a picture, like a hop head and a secret of the universe kick. Me ever find out anything about the spiders? except for nervous notions like I'd had during the recent fracas. What a laugh. The funniest thing, ha ha, was that I had ended up the least trusted person. Sid wouldn't give me time to explain how he, I deduced what, I had happen, what had happened to the maintainer. And even when Lily spoke up and admitted hiding it, she acted so bored, I don't think anybody believed her. Although she did spill the realistic detail that she had used partial inversion on the glove. She just turned it inside out to make it a right and then done a full inversion to get the lining back inside. I tried to get Doc to confirm that he'd reasoned the thing out the same way I had, but he said he'd been blacked out the whole time, except during the first part of the hunt, and he didn't remember having any bright ideas at all. Right now, he was having Maud explain to him twice in detail everything that had happened. I decided that it was going to take a little more work before my reputation as a great detective was established. I looked over the edge of the couch and just made out the gloom one of Bruce's black gloves. It must have been kicked there. I fished it up. 
It was the right hand one, my big clue, and I was sick of it. Got mittens, God forbid. I slung it away, and like a lurking octopus, Illy shot up a tentacle from the next couch, where I hadn't known he was resting, and snatched the glove like it was a morsel of underwater garbage. These E's can, ETs can seem pretty shuddery non-human at times. I thought of what a cold-blooded, skin-saving louse Illy had been, and about Sid and his easy suspicions, and Eric and my black eye, and how, as usual, I got left alone in the end, my men. Bruce had explained about being an A-Tech. Like a lot of us, he'd had several widely different jobs during his first weeks in the change world, and one of them had been as secretary to a group of the minor atomic boys from the Manhattan Project Earth satellite days. I gathered he'd also absorbed some of his bothersome ideas from them. I hadn't quite decided yet what species of heroic heel he belonged to, but he was thick with Mark and Eric again, everybody's men. Sid didn't have to argue with anybody. All the wild compulsions and mighty resolves were dead now, anyway, until they had a good long rest. I could sure use one myself, I knew. The party at the piano was getting wilder. Lily had been dancing, the black bottom on top of it, and now she dumped down into Sid's and Seven C's arms, taking a long time about it. She'd been drinking a lot, and her little gray dress looked about as innocent on her as diapers would on Nell Gwynn. She continued her dance, distributing her marks of favor equally between Sid, Eric, and the satyr. Bo didn't mind a bit, but serenely pounded out, tonight's the night, which she'd practically shouted to him not two minutes ago. I was glad to be out of the party. Who could compete with a highly experienced, utterly disillusioned 17-year-old really throwing herself away for the first time? Something touched my hand. Illy had stretched a tentacle into a furry wire to return me the black glove, although he ought to have known I didn't want it. I pushed it away, privately calling Illy a washed-out moronic tarantula. And right away, I felt a little guilty. What right had I to be critical of Illy? Would my own character have shown to advantage if I'd been locked in with 11 octopoids a billion years away? For that matter, where did I get off being critical of anyone? Still, I was glad to be out of the party, though I kept on watching it. Bruce was drinking alone at the bar. Once Sid had gone over to him, and they'd had one together, and I'd heard Bruce reciting from Rupert Brooke those deliberately corny lines. The one land I know where men with splendid hearts may go. And Cambridgeshire, of all England, the shire of men who understand. And I'd remembered that Brooke, too, had died young in World War I. My ideas had got fuzzy. But mostly Bruce was just calmly drinking by himself. Every once in a while, Lily would look at him and stop dead at her dancing and laugh. I'd figured out this Bruce, Lily, Eric business as well as I cared to. Lily had wanted the nest with all her heart, and nothing else would ever satisfy her. And now she'd go to hell in her own way and probably die of Bright's disease for a third time in the change world. Bruce hadn't wanted the nest or Lily as much as he wanted the change world and the chances it gave for soldierly cavorting and poetic drunks. Lily's seed wasn't his idea of healing the cosmos. Maybe he'd make a real mutiny someday, but more likely he'd stick to barroom epics. His and Lily's infatuation wouldn't die completely, no matter how rancid it looked right now. The real love angle might go, but change would magnify the romance angle, and it might seem to them like a big thing of a sort if they met again. Eric had his comrade shaped to suit him, who'd had the guts and cleverness to disarm the bomb, he'd had the guts to trigger. You have to hand it to Eric for having the nerve to put us all in a situation where we'd have to find the maintainer or fry. 
but I don't know anything disgusting enough to hand to him. I had tried a while back. I'd gone up to him and said, Hey, how's my wicked little commandant? Forgotten your old soul fighter? And as he turned, I clawed my nails and slammed him across the cheek. That's how I got the black eye. Maud wanted to put an electronic leech on it, but I took the old handkerchief in ice water. Well, at any rate, Eric had his scratches to match Bruce's. Not as deep, but four of them. And I told myself maybe they'd get infected. I hadn't washed my hands since the hunt. Not that Eric doesn't love scars. Mark was the one who helped me up after Eric knocked me down. You got any omnias for that? I snapped at him. For what? Oh, for everything that's been happening to us. He actually seemed to think for a moment. And then he said, Omnia mutantur, nihil interit. Meaning? All things change, but nothing is really lost. It would be a wonderful <laughs> philosophy to stand with against the change winds, also damn silly. I wondered if Mark really believed it. I wished I could. Sometimes I come close to thinking it's a lot of baloney trying to be any decent kind of demon, even a good entertainer. Then I tell myself, that's life, Greta. You've got to love through it somehow. But there are times when some of those, these cookies are not too easy to love. Something brushed the palm of my hand again. It was Illy's tentacle with the tendrils of the tip spread out like a little brush. I started to pull my hand away, but then I realized the loon was simply lonely. I surrendered my hand to the patterned gossamer pressures of feather talk. Right away, I got the words. Feeling lonely, little girl? It almost floored me, I tell you. Here I was understanding feather talk, which I just didn't, and I was understanding it in English, which didn't make sense at all. For a second, I thought Illy must have spoken, but I knew he hadn't. And for a couple more seconds, I thought he was working telepathy on me, using the feather talk as clues. Then I tumbled to what was happening. He was playing English on my palm like on a keyboard of his squeak box. And since I could play English on a squeak box myself, the mind translated automatically. Realizing this almost gave my mind stage fright, but I was too fagged to be hocused by so self-consciousness. I just lay back and let the thoughts come through. It's good to have someone talk to you, even an underweight octopus. And without the squeaks, Illy didn't sound so silly. His phrasing was soberer. Feeling sad, Greta girl, because you'll never understand what's happening to us all? Because you'll never be anything but a shadow fighting shadows and trying to love shadows in between the battles. It's time you understood we're not really fighting a war at all, although it looks that way but going through a kind of evolution, though not exactly the kind Eric had in mind. Your Terran thought has a word for it and a theory for it, a theory that recurs on many worlds. It's about the four orders of life, plants, animals, men, and demons. Plants are energy binders. They can't move through space or time, but they can clutch energy and transform it. Animals are space binders. They can move through space. Man, Terran or ET, Lunan or non-Lunan, is a time binder. He has memory. Demons are the fourth order of evolution, possibility binders. They can make all of what might be part of what is, and that is their evolutionary function. Resurrection is like the 
metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly. A third order being breaks out of the chrysalis of its lifeline into fourth order life. The leap from the rift cocoon of an unchanging reality is like the first animal's leap when he ceases to be a plant. And the change world is the core of meaning behind the many myths of immortality. All evolution looks like a war at first. Octopoids against monopoids, mammals against reptiles, and it has a necessary dialectic. There must be the thesis, we call it snake, and the antithesis, spider, before there can be the ultimate synthesis, when all possibilities are fully realized in one ultimate universe. The change war isn't the blind destruction it seems. Remember, that the serpent is your symbol of wisdom and the spider your sign for patience. The two names are rightly frightening to you for all high existence is a mixture of horror and delight. And don't be surprised, Greta girl, at the range of my words and thoughts. In a way, I've had a billion years to study Terra and learn her languages and myths. Who are the real spiders and snakes? Meaning who were the first possibility binders? Who was Adam, Greta Girl? Who was Cain? Who were Eve and Lilith? In binding all possibility, the demons also bind the metal with the material. All fourth order beings live inside and outside of all minds throughout the whole cosmos. Even this place is, after its fashion, a giant brain. Its floor is the brain pan. The boundary of the void is the cortex of gray matter. Yes, even the major and minor maintainers are analogs of the pineal and pituitary glands, which in some form sustain all nervous systems. There's the real picture, Greta girl. The feather talk faded out and Illy's tendrils tips merged into a soft pad on which I fingered Thanks, Daddy Longlegs. Chewing over in my mind what Illy had just told me, I looked back at the gang around the piano. The party seemed to be breaking up. At least some of them were chopping away at it. Sid had gone to the control divan and was getting set to tune in Egypt. Mark and Cabby were there with him, all bursting with eagerness and the vision of tanks on ranks of mounted zombie bowmen going up in a mushroom cloud. I thought of what Illy had told me, and I managed to smile. Seems we've got to win and lose all the battles every which way. Mark had just put on his Parthian costume, groaning cheerfully. Trousers again. And was striding around under a hat like a fur-lined ice cream cone, and with the sleeves of his metal stuffed candies flapping over his hands. He waved a short sword with a heart-shaped guard at Bruce and Eric and told them to get a move on. Cabby was going along on the operation, wearing the old woman disguise intended for Benson Carter. I got a half-hearted kick out of knowing she was going to have to cover that chest and hobble. Bruce and Eric weren't taking orders from Mark just yet. Eric went over and said something to Bruce at the bar, and Bruce got down and went over with Eric to the piano. And Eric tapped Bo on the shoulder and leaned over and said something to him. And Bo nodded and yanked Limehouse Blues to a fast close and started another piece, something slow and nostalgic. Eric and Bruce waved to Mark and smiled, 
as if to show him that whether he came over and stood with them or not, the legate and the lieutenant and the commandant were very much together. And while Seven C hugged Lily with a simple enthusiasm that made me wonder why I've wasted so much imagination on genetic treatments for him, Eric and Bruce sang. To the legion of the lost ones, to the cohort of the damned, to our brothers in the tunnels outside time. A thing as we change, resistant zombies, raised from death and robot crammed, and commandos of the spiders, here's to crime. We're three blind mice on the wrong time track. Hush, hush, hush. We've lost our now and will never get back. Hush, hush, hush. Change commandos out on the spree. Damned through all possibility ghost girls think kindly on such as we hush 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 while they were singing i looked down at my charcoal skirt and over at maud and lily and i thought Three gray hustlers for three black hussars. That's our speed. Well, I'd never thought of myself as a high speed job winning all the races. I wouldn't feel comfortable that way. Come to think of it, we've got a lot to lose and win in all the races in the long run, the way the course is laid out. I fingered to Illy. That's the picture, all right, Spider Boy. This is where Fritz Lieber leaves us. An esoteric bombshell is revealed, the big time. <laughs> 